Gary Lackman, or Gary Valentine, which was his uh, stage name at the time, first became known as the bass player and one of the founding members of the band Blondie. Now, this has nothing to do with the conversation you're about to hear, but it's also not something I can just not mention, you know? Like, that is a legit, undeniable contribution to the culture of the 20th century. Even here in Russia, which coincidentally uh, was also known by a different name in the 70s, there were many people, including some of our most talented musicians, that, you know, were inspired by this music. People had to really look for these albums. They were not easy to obtain uh, in the, you know, behind the Iron Curtain. And they shared them. They wrote down the lyrics. They studied the music. They tried to copy it, maybe. They had to look for some friend who understands English to try to figure out what Debbie Harry is singing about. Well, apparently she wants this guy to call her. And I'm just saying that's not a, a, a trivial thing to inspire large quantities of people with music you've made all over the world. Uh, that's worth a mention. So I, I guess that's what I'm doing. I'm just mentioning this at the top of the show so that we can move on to the substance. Now, playing the bass in Blondie is not what Gary Lackman is known for today. For the past 20 years or so, he's been writing books on the history of mysticism, of uh, esoteric thought. And he's written biographies of different prominent figures. Some are, you know, dinner table friendly names like Carl Jung. That's perfectly acceptable to bring up in a polite conversation. Some are close to the fringe, like Aleister Crowley or Madame Blavatsky or Gurdjieff, P.D. Uspensky, people like that. And then uh, his new book, which we're talking about today, uh, is called Dark Star Rising, and it's also about esoteric thought. It talks about chaos magic and the new thought movement and other, let's say, unorthodox ways of relating to the world and to reality. But it's filled with names that you will recognize, names that belong on the pages of the New York Times. That's Steve Bannon, Donald Trump, Richard Spencer, the punch Nazi guy, Vladimir Putin... Um, there is also this very peculiar Russian character named Alexander Dugin, who I'm going to bet most of our audience doesn't know of, but who does have a kind of a presence in the American popular culture uh, as well now. His, uh, <laughs> his bearded face and thick Russian accent and uh, his ideas of, what is it, fighting postmodernism with... using postmodernism to fight against postmodernists, something like that. Uh, all of that is known and familiar to the audience of Alex Jones's Infowars, which is, I should say, you know, millions of people. That's your countrymen. So there are these people. There's also Pepe the Frog and uh, 4chan Trolls and the ancient Egyptian god by the name of Kek, who nowadays rules the fictional Republic of Kekistan and apparently meddles with the American elections like everybody else does. So there are a lot of interesting characters in this book, and they're all tied together into a very peculiar vision of uh, what's going on in the American and international politics today. And it has to do with how these people view the world, how they relate to reality, how they act on their beliefs, and it has to do with magic and the power of positive thinking and um, postmodernist sensibilities of different kinds. And, you know, I want to say that the pieces of the puzzle that Gary uses in this book are all facts. They're real. There's something you can read about in places like the New York Times. Whether they hold up together as a coherent view of what's going on, you know, whether the connections are all properly made, that is for you to decide, I guess. I've seen different reviews on the book. I haven't seen negative ones, nothing bad, but some people felt it's sort of an interesting exercise, a fun read, something not to be taken too seriously. Others felt that's a scary and true description of what is actually going on in the world today. I think it's... I think it's probably both. You know, any version of reality is to some extent a make-believe world, right? That's just human culture by its nature. It has qualities of 
a play or a story or a drama or you know a game with fluid rules like a game that children would come up with if you leave them alone for a few hours without electronic devices or a different kind of game like you know that Donald Trump keeps talking about the game that he is apparently very good at and the man is you know the president of the most powerful country in the world so I think it might be worth our time to try to figure out what kind of game he thinks he's playing and then the other thing is even when a proposed view of reality is easy to ridicule, I don't think you want to be overly confident in your view of reality and your place in it when there are, you know, competing theories and competing practices. Hillary Clinton thought she's good at playing the political game. She thought she had the presence in her pocket. And then I don't know if she even realized how it happened that suddenly she's fighting against cartoon frogs that may or may not be Nazis. That was a real thing. And then she lost to those frogs, right? So, you know, Ken Kesey said, get them into your movie before they get you into theirs. And I know many Americans today feel that they got trapped in something like a reality TV show with this outlandish caricature of a character as a boss, right? Telling everybody they're fired. And in Russia, we're more used to literary metaphors. You know, people say, feels like we live in a novel, like a weird multi-layered novel with quite a bit of dark humor and a political satirical dimension to it and kind, a kind of underlying paradoxical philosophy. We have a guy who writes books like that to explain our life to us. I guess I'm saying that this feeling that reality... Maybe a slip-in, maybe not exactly real. That's, that's a Leonard Cohen line. He had this on Democracy that uh, had the line, it's coming from the feel that it ain't exactly real. Or it's real, but it ain't exactly there. So that feeling of it not being exactly real, I think is something that a lot of people relate to all over the world. And when the kind of consensus everyday reality starts to feel less real than we're used to, then these alternative versions of what's going on sometimes get a little more real. They, they get a little... They, things that you previously would think is are just strange and absurd suddenly gain a little bit of weight. And, um, well, Gary has a lot of interesting things to say about all of this, uh, so I'll just stop now and let you listen to the conversation i hope you like it i enjoyed it a lot uh please do let me know what you think about this in the comment section and uh if this is too much for you i get it you know i get it but i don't know what to tell you i think the news are going to be difficult to digest for you in the next few years the world is getting weird so brace yourself Okay, I'll talk to you later. Bye. Okay, um, all right, so we're talking about uh, Dark Star Rising, your new book, and uh, am I right? I only discovered your work fairly recently, but I have the feeling I'm going to be going through your back catalog. Um, am I right to say that this is a bit of a departure and maybe now you're finding new audience that is coming for the politics rather than for the occult uh, esoteric stuff? Well, I hope so. Um, uh, it, it's it's a new departure in the sense that it's more uh, current events than mm -hmm. um, anything else I've written. I mean, I've written about politics and the occult before, um, 10 years ago, 2008. A book of mine just called Politics, the Occult uh, came out. And that was more of a historical study. And um, sort of the idea behind that book was that um, usually if you talk about relationship between politics and the occult, it tends to be put in the context of uh, far right, you know, politics. And I wanted to show like, yes, while there is obviously that there is that uh, there's also a kind of progressive occultism. You can find it in, you know, people like Madame Blavatsky and so on and so on. So that was like sort of the, the aim of that book. Uh, but this one, Dark Star Rising, is different because it's about um, it, it, it is about a kind of occult politics that is 
seems to be happening on on the far right, and it seems to be happening now or in in recent times. So it's more of the moment, mm-hmm. and it's more sort of uh, journalist or you know reportage uh, sort of work uh, than a uh, historical one. Although it has historical context and there's philosophy and and so on. Uh, but uh, I would hope that it could go outside of the occult niche, put it that way, or the alternative niche. And it seems to have reached some people. Uh, it got reviewed in Forbes, um, which I thought was like one of the first reviews was in Forbes magazine, which I thought was strange. Uh, but that was that was good. And there's some other, some other things. But I think perhaps the sort of the magic tag um, may prevent, um, you know, people uh, from sort of picking it up and touching it and all that. But, I mean, mm-hmm. it, it has got some um, attention on sort of the wider kind of alternative fringe. So, uh, you know, we'll see. It, um, it's been doing well, and uh, I keep getting asked for interviews, so, you know. And, and how is it getting perceived by the more, let, well, let's say the Forbes uh, uh, review? Well, I mean, people like that, that's kind of like funny. Uh, right. the, I forget the, uh, the reviewer's name, but he enjoyed it. He said it was a very good read. And it's an interesting take on things, but of course it's a kind of crazy idea, and it's you know it's not rational and so on. And there were some others who again said the same kind of thing. And then there's some readers who are saying, oh well, uh, um, the lefties will come up with anything to uh, you know rationalize how Trump got elected. And you know, in <laughs> fact, I'm not I'm not a lefty. You know, I'm not a righty. I'm 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 not even in the middle. I'm I'm just sort of reporting on all this sort of thing. So and then you have people um, sort of feeling. Uh, uh, like I'm saying, oh well, uh, you know, you're saying that Trump couldn't couldn't have got elected um, under any kind of real, you know, um, mm-hmm. honest kind of means. He needed to use black magic, and I'm not really saying any of the things. The whole idea is that there seem to be elements of that taking place around in in the political world today. So I'm not necessarily arguing that you know magic put Trump into office, but I am saying it seems to be happening that there are some people that are participating in in kind of magical practices that are involved in all this. But it's against a broader backdrop of a kind of um, almost metaphysical kind of uh, condition, this sort of postmodern condition we're in now, where we've entered this post-truth and alternative fact world, where in which you could say it's magical in the sense that the constraints on reality, uh, Mm -hmm. they're, they're no longer in place. So anything can happen. And so um, it's, it's this kind of, idea that this sort of magical politics is taking place in this broader um, kind of world now where the whole idea of reality has become very malleable. Right. So you could you could almost uh, interchange the words like magic with words like postmodernism or post Exactly, exactly. I mean, there's, what, what, what I'm seeing is, is similarities between sort of postmodernism, um, chaos magic, which which comes up in it, and this philosophy known as new thought, which is about the idea that the mind creates reality and thoughts are causative. Um, one branch of which, known as positive thinking, is something that Trump himself mm-hmm. is a devotee of. So uh, it seemed all these sorts of things were happening at the same time, and they all seem to be based on this idea that you know how we, the way in which we understood reality has changed. Uh, and th- things have become very different. And so I decided to follow that trail. Um, and it takes me to some very interesting places. You know? All right. So let's let's just, you know, take the first step into the through the looking glass or into the rabbit <laughs> hole or whatever it is. Um, let's start. My favorite part from this whole milieu of peculiar ways of looking at things is Pepe the Frog and the adventures that it uh, got into. And the first time I heard the connection between Pepe and Chaos, I guess, Yes. was uh, when Jordan Peterson tried to explain to Joe Rogan what Kekistan was. And uh, oh. let me like jot down the narrative and you tell me if I got it right. Okay. So Sounds here's good. how Peterson put it. Um, there were these people online who are kind of like internet hooligans, you know, like to use different kinds of memes, draw a swastika or two uh, here and there. And they were using this cartoon character, this cartoon frog named Pepe in many of their memes. Then... Oh, and then, of course, when I'm used by the results of those memes, they would use LOL, laughing out loud, which then they later discovered is kek in Korean, K-E-K. So they changed LOL to K-E-K. Then they discovered that kek is also the name of an ancient Egyptian god of chaos, who's also a frog. So their reaction to that, of course, was kek. 
right? And then, uh, and then the Free Republic of Kekistan was founded with uh, God of Chaos, Kek or Pepe, uh, as the leader of that imaginary world. And these people are supposedly were supposedly instrumental to, or at least in some to some extent, instrumental to Trump's victory of the presidency. So is that all right? Oh, I think you got it. I mean, the only thing I'd add is that um, uh, one of the things that happened to sort of cement this was that, um, uh, well, the thing about Keck, it, it was sort of a glitch in this World of Warcraft video game. Mm. And it had to do with the Korean language. So whenever they wanted to, you know, you know type LOL, it came up K-E-K. I see. And so they, they just gave up and just did K-E-K. And then they picked it up. And then subsequent... They realized, oh, somebody said, oh, my God, Kek is this Egyptian, you know, frog-headed god of, of chaos. And then, but the, the other bit of this was that when they were posting, mm -hmm. um, you know, on 4chan, it's anonymous. Um, you don't have a name, but you're, you're given a, a number, and it's an eight-digit number. And the people posting about Pepe and Trump and all that, they were seeing that they were getting double numbers or triple numbers or four numbers in a row, uh, you know, in, in, in the same eight-digit sort of signature. Mm -hmm. And they kept betting whether they were going to get one or not. And it seemed that they were getting some kind of approval or some from kind of acknowledgement universe. from the Internet God uh -huh. in some way. So every time they posted about Pepe, it would come up a trip or a dub and then all this kind of thing. And then uh, there's, a, there's a famous meme with Pepe as Keck and there's all numbers around him and, you know, this kind of some kind of coded symbol and all that. But, yeah, I mean, it's just remarkable synchronicities. And that's what I, 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 I tracked it down. And, I mean, the other strange thing that didn't get mentioned at the time was that, as you said, K-E-K -E came out of the Korean language. And then, you know, Trump, one of the things he started getting into oh, was yeah. Kim Jong-boom, as it were, you know, <laughs> this whole Korean thing. So it, it, another <laughs> layer to these strange synchronicities took place. But no, you pretty much nailed it. I mean, that, and, that, and this is the kind of thing I've run through so many times. I was glad that you did it so that I didn't have to say it because mm -hmm. I've said it so many times in, in, in interviews recently. But yeah, that's exactly it, yes. So uh, let's say with, we can start with that part of the story. What is your, how do I put it? When looking at that and, and uh, you know, attaching terms like chaos magic or meme magic to it, mm. are you yourself looking at this as kind of like, hey, that's a peculiar way of looking at things? Or are you granting this kind of thinking some sort of agency and, and real um, um, yeah. influence um, on the situation? Well, I leave it open uh, because it seems to be part of a, of, a, of a complex of things happening at the same time. I mean, I was talking about our, our ideas about reality becoming very flexible, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, in this post-truth world, in the, this post-modern world. And it's something I call trickle-down metaphysics, where, um, and put it in a nutshell, you know, Nietzsche in the late 19th century predicted this kind of nihilism that was on its way, and it was unavoidable. And he said it wasn't for today, and it wasn't going to happen tomorrow, but it's going to happen the day after tomorrow. And I think that this is us. And I think the sort of nihilism that he saw from the metaphysical heights has finally trickled down to the sort of everyday lowlands. And, you know, we, we've sort of inherited this sort of relativity. All values are relative, all truths are relatives, all realities are relative and beliefs and all that sort of thing. And um, we inhabit this kind of world where there, there, are, there is no truth with the capital T anymore. Um, and this was something that worried Nietzsche, uh, but we, we seem to have kind of plunged into it and uh, people are taking advantage of it. And so, um, and the other, another side of that is the whole interchange between reality and its representation in television or on the net and all that. And, right. you know, the, it's a cliche by now, but the most popular thing on television is reality TV. Mm -hmm. And there's even reality television shows about people who watch reality television shows. So it becomes this kind of, you know, doubly self-reflective kind of mirror kind of thing. And it seems that the, the, the similar, crowd, you know, the, 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 the simulation of reality is becoming increasingly more and more vivid and more, you know, real, we have HD, 3D, all this sort of thing. So it strikes me that we're putting all this reality into the represented world, into the television. And it, it, to put it, fun, it fun, you know, in a funny way, it seems it's going to get crowded in there, in that space, mm -hmm. and something's going to have to pop out. Um, and that's what I sort of think of as Trump, because he was a reality television uh, celebrity for many, many years in precisely the kind of... 
um, position that he is now as, as you know, leader of the country. He was the boss and this, you know, right, the apprentice right, right. and all that. He did exactly the same thing, hired and fired, wore the wore the suit and, you know, looked like, you know, very <laughs> strong leader figure. So he sort of popped out of that, you know, status of being in this represented world into the actual world. And so I'm I'm, I'm putting all this magic within there. And the reason I keep my mind open about it and is because the one thing I will accept and will, I, I will say that I believe is true is synchronicities. And this mm-hmm. is, you know, C.G. Jung's term for what we call meaningful coincidence. You know, when something happening in your head, you see outside in, in, the, in the external world, but there's no causal relationship, but it has a deep meaningful one. And it's so obviously meaningful that we can't just say it's just coincidence. It's something that has a real sort of effect on us. And... What seems to be happening with Pepe and the net and, you know, the meme magic and all that is that that kind of strange phenomena of meaningful coincidence between, you know, my imagination and the world seem to be taking place between the Internet and and the world and the real world. And we think of the Internet as a kind of collective exteriorized imagination. Mm -hmm. Um, Then you know, we can transfer the same kind of phenomena to it. And that seems to be what happened, right? The, the 4chan people started seeing all these kind of coincidences between their Bane posting about Dark Knight Rises and, you know, the, the tragic German Wings 9525 flight. They saw coincidences there. And so it seemed, well, if this was happening by itself spontaneously, you know, can you make it happen? And that's, I would say, the essence of magic is, is can you induce synchronicities, you know, I mean, they happen by themselves, but can you make them happen? And that pretty much is what sort of magic, in a broad sense, chaos magic, um, in a more specific sense, but also the kind of new thought and positive thinking that Trump is, you know, um, uh, sort of uh, saturated and that he grew up in. Um, it doesn't use magic per se in terms of ritual, but the whole idea that the mind can create um, situations in reality Mm-hmm. can arrange reality for you and it's very much along the same lines of inducing some kind of synchronicity and so on and one of the other things that struck me is very interesting about both chaos magic and new thought and positive thinking is that they're all sort of results driven they're very practical they're very utilitarian it's very much about making something happen in in, in, the, in the real world i mean from the new thought positive thinking side it's all about sort of the gospel of prosperity mm-hmm. and you know wealth and health and all of that um, the chaos magic side, um, this kind of started up in the 70s around the same time as punk. And th- these people were just fed up with all the Golden Dawn and even the Crowley kind of magic, which is all about kind of, you know, states of consciousness and contacting your higher holy guardian angel. And they were bored to tears with that. And they wanted something, you know, happen. And they wanted to like, let's make something happen. Make that guy fall down or, you know, or, you know, <laughs> make, make, make money come tomorrow in the mail or something. And so that's, it just got stripped down to doing that much like punk. Punk, you know, was about just, you know, raw, you know, basic right. kind of energies and things. So, but it, it too is very results driven. It's very much about, you know, some kind of, and there's even a famous chaos magic book called the book of results, which could be mm-hmm. a title for a, a new thought sort of thing. So again, there's similarities. There's sort of kind of, um, similar styles and, 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 and kind of character to all these sorts of things happening at the same time. And so, but because I, I've had enough synchronicities in my own experience and I've been reading about this stuff for 40 years, um, I just accept that, okay, that they do happen. They're, they, they are a phenomena in the world. I don't know how they happen and I'm not convinced by any particular account and, you know, whether it's quantum physics or, 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 or something else. But I, I, I do accept them phenomenologically as something that actually takes place in the world. Mm-hmm. All right. So I think if you accept that, then I can't – my, my intellectual integrity um, leads me to say that I'm, I'm not compelled to categorically deny the possibility. But did it happen for sure? I don't know. And there's no way you could know. But I just find it interesting that if you – there's this one incident – um, you know the the one that sort of got this going was with Richard Spencer and the, his his um, uh, sort of uh, declaration uh, to uh, the the annual meeting of the National you know Policy Institute that happened just about a week or so after Trump's election, <clears throat> where he opened you know this meeting. And the National Policy Institute is this kind of you know harmless name for a group that many people consider to be you know very white supremacists and, and mm-hmm. so on and so on. Uh, but he started this meeting by saying, hail Trump, you know, hail our hero, hail our victory. We made this happen. We dream this into reality. You know, we willed Trump into the, 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 in the White House. 
and they talk about their vic their victory of the will. So he's taking responsibility for this. And this this was covered in all the newspapers and on the media and CNN. And it wasn't just in some weird you know, uh, you you might not have got it there, but it was certainly um, no. I think it, I've seen. I think I it think it was I've... in the news. And the the reason it was in the news was not so much for that as for the response from the crowd because they started giving the the sort of you know right. national socialist salutes and so on and so on. And um, that that got you know in more or less headlines and. Um, but one fellow who picked up on this was a fellow named Harv Bishop, and he writes about New Thought, uh, and he has a blog about New Thought. And he, he heard what Spencer was saying, and he's basically thought, my God, this is, this is exactly what New Thought is about, making dreams reality. Not, not in the broad metaphorical sense, but in actual concrete, you know, results-based sense. You know? Do you think Spencer was using when he said it would dream Trump into reality? Well, 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 this, is, well this, is, this, is, this was the idea. This was, this was what got the, the whole thing going. Uh -huh. he, he seemed to be doing that. And then it turned out that the way of doing it was through using Pepe. Pepe on the internet. <laughs> Pepe, Pepe was somehow a kind of magical symbol. Mm -hmm. He became a kind, it's known as a sigil. And this is kind of, and that's the thing about chaos magic where it, it differs. It doesn't use the old, you know, sigils and symbols and all the kind of uh, magical spells and all, all of the traditional, you know, implements of ceremonial magic. It's, it's more like kind of, you know, postmodernism where it just grabs whatever's at hand and puts it together. And so chaos magic sort of makes up its own spells and it does its own magic kind of, um, you know, um, on the run. It kind of just thinks on its feet as it were. And this is what they were doing instead of using, you know, sort of things in the 3d world, they were using internet memes. And so the idea was to somehow Pepe, he's charged with all this intention and will and imagination and they have memes of him you know with trump looking over the mexican border is one of the deplorables there's a meme of him like as trump and so on and the whole idea was to saturate that saturate the net with that and that where before it happened spontaneously somehow the combined intention or just the you know the saturation something would happen and hey trump got elected you know, they even thought that they were they were responsible for something happening to Hillary Clinton. There was the the 9/11 um, memorial that she attended, and she was suddenly ill at uh -huh. it, and they thought that she had somehow offended Keck, or Keck had somehow. So I mean, you know, there's no way you can know whether it's true or not, but in the context of all these other things, um, so you have that. You have you have these guys being interested in new thought. You've got Trump himself, you know, a devotee of positive thinking. Trump himself is like a natural chaos magician. If you look at his whole style, I mean, right. the one word, one word that characterizes Trump's administration, I would say, is chaos. You know, there's probably a few others, but that would be one of the ones that many people would say. And what struck me in the book is that his own natural style seems to be much like the, the kind of techniques or the practices um, uh, that the chaos magicians, you know, are, are supposed to uh, uh, pursue and, you know, to work their magic. Um, and again, it's very results-based. And the whole idea that, um, you know, reality is malleable, the whole idea that uh, you can create your own reality, that beliefs are something that you put on and take off the same way you do clothes, truth is something that is, you know, you use, it's a tool. These are all things that Trump just does, naturally. He doesn't, you know, <laughs> he, does, he doesn't adhere to any kind of, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure you never heard of chaos magic. And, right. and in saying this, in no way do I want to stigmatize chaos magicians. I'm not saying that they, they, they know about this or they, you know, uh, accept it or, or even would want it. I'm sure they wouldn't want to be associated with them, probably. But he seems to do it naturally. And then you get the connection with Keck being the god of chaos and, and so on and so on. So all these strange, in, in proper synchronistic kind of way, all these str strange things seem to kind of be caught in this kind of swirl of stuff. And the, the, the other uh, sort of big uh, kind of uh, clue that came soon after Trump's election was um, this article that the New York Times ran about uh, a talk that Steve Bannon gave to a group in the Vatican. Mm -hmm. The article came out in February two, 2017, and the talk was in 2014 before you know Trump <clears throat> had declared his intention. But um, it, and um, it was to a group called the Human Dignity Institute that are um, uh, 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 a select group of very conservative sort of churchmen. So, any case, in the midst of his kind of general talk about um, you know the global Tea Party movement and traditional values and you know fighting Islamic fascism um, one of the things that Steve Bannon did was he name-checked Julius Evola now 
if you know who Julius Evola is, this this is a strange thing, and this was uh, this was so in the headline more or less of, of the New York Times article, and Evola is was this twentieth um, century uh, esoteric philosopher who also had leanings towards the far right. Um, he uh, tried to ingratiate himself first with Mussolini, then he did try to do the same with National Socialism. Uh, after the war, he was this kind of. Uh, intellectual figure in the background whose ideas informed very uh, different um, sort of uh, neo-fascist uh, new new right movements in Italy. And subsequent to that, since his death in uh, the early 70s, um, he's been this kind of, um, he's been sort of rediscovered um, by a kind of right wing branch of, of kind of esotericism. And he's one of the intellectual figures that the alt-right uh, points to. As as one of, as 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 one of their sort of sources for their own ideas that make them different than just skinheads and mm-hmm. and you know rednecks and 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 white power people and all that. So okay, so you have Steve Bannon who became you know one of Trump, a close advisor of Trump at least during his campaign and in the early days of his administration. He's name checking this esoteric philosopher who um, you know ingratiating himself with the uh, far right politics. It looks like you want to ask me something. Yeah, when you say name check, and what do you mean exactly? What is the context in which? Well, it, it, I mean, it? it's in, in the. Well, I'll get to that. And and in, in the course of this this talk he gave, he was talking about Putin. Uh, he was talking about Vladimir Putin, and he was sort of praising him and also saying he was wary. But one of the things he liked about Putin is that Putin uh, was standing for traditional values. You know, traditional sort of social roles and gender roles and family roles and so on and so on, uh, against the kind of hyper hyper liberalism and and sort of um, you know individualism of 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 the West, and um, in the midst of talking about Putin, he says he has someone around him. There's someone in Putin's circle who reads Julius Evola, mm-hmm. and, and he kind of he kind of conflates the whole idea of traditional values and this philosophy known as traditionalism. Which is the philosophy that Evola basically is uh, is a exponent of, um, and who Bannon is referring to when he's sort of allu- uh, mentioning Evola is this is Alexander Dugan, who is um, someone who's around now, and at different times he's been believed to have more or less influence, or his ideas. Of, it's always kind of you know. Uh, uncertain exactly how much influence he's had on Putin or how, how much his ideas have got there. But in any case, he's the person who Bannon was sort of alluding to. And again, Dugan uh, is into chaos magic. Dugan, um, if you've seen any of sort of some uh, photographs of him and, and some videos, he often has the kind of chaos, the eight-pointed chaos star in the background. Mm-hmm. And one of the youth groups that he um, sort of uh, founded uh, a kind of very nationalistic group they had. Uh, the, I, I think, yeah, it, it was the Eurasian Youth Organization or something That's along right. those lines. They had the the Chaos Star on their T-shirts and all this kind of thing. And he too <laughs> practices, or at least has written about a kind of mental science, a kind of the idea that thoughts can affect reality. And this was something that Evola did mm-hmm. too in the 1920s. Mm-hmm. In fact, Evola. If, in, if indeed Spencer and the alt-right did try to put Trump into office, they were doing exactly what Evola was doing in the 1920s when he tried to influence Mussolini. Uh, not to put him in office, he already was in power, but what he wanted to do was to try and imbue Mussolini's fascists with the ancient Roman noble virtues, because he, he didn't think the Italians were particularly good material to work with. Um, <laughs> And so he and other members of this group called the UR group um, in the 1920s who, who wrote in this journal they had under different pseudonyms, they practiced these sort of rituals to try and, you know, project these kind of um, virtues and, 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 and kind of characteristics into, into the uh, Italian of ashes. So, again, the same kind of thing was going on. So, again, it's another part of this sort of puzzle where each little bit gets a little bit closer and closer to each other. Chaos, magic, new thought, right. the right wing kind of comes in. Um, and again, it's happening in Russia as well. Uh, I mean, um, so that was kind of, once I looked at the first thing, once I looked at Spencer and, and um, you know, uh, and then and then Bannon. And then my, my editor at the time um, at Penguin, uh, uh, Mitch Harvitz, who's since gone on um, to other things, he basically said, well, you know, something's up, something's going on now, isn't it? Because all this strange esoteric material that's usually on the fringe, on the mm-hmm. margin, mm-hmm. It, 
had got into the mainstream. You know, I mean, it, it doesn't happen every day that the New York Times talks about Julius Evola. Mm-hmm. Um, and certainly not in the context of a close advisor to the, the, the recently elected pre- president of the United States, uh, who we know had has very strong right-wing uh, views, you know, um, uh, and so on and so on. And, uh, you know, reading articles in, like, Foreign Affairs or The Economist and, and, and other, uh, you know, more mainstream, you know, uh, uh, very level-headed, sober uh, uh, magazines about Dugan. You know, they call him Putin's Rasputin, which is an, an exaggeration. But, um, again, it's that kind of thing. And suddenly it's like, again, all this very, very stuff that I, I've been reading about myself for the last 20, uh, well, I'm reading about it for 40 years. I've been writing about it for at least 20. But it was always on the side. Now it's like, oh, my God, it's right there. And so that's when my editor commissioned me to write this. So I, I tried to capture the moment. Because what I felt, actually, was that history had caught up. Because I've been writing about sort of the influence of this esoteric counterculture on the mainstream over for the last 400 years. And now it's thought to be, oh, God, exactly what I've been talking about is, is happening. Because my own belief is that you know we've marginalized this irrational whatever you want to call it, mystical, and sort of kept it on the side. And now, instead of integrating it in in a positive way, in a way that's creative and can push us forward, it's come back. But it's come back in a way we, you know, many of us are uh, not quite, you know, at home with. We don't feel comfortable with it. And that's one of the things I say in the book. I say, in in some way, you know, the occult community, let's say, the occult-friendly community that I'm, I'm, you know, belong, uh, I'm a part of, we too have kind of wanted you know, um, the kind of Western logical scientific ideas about truth and rationality and all of that to be a bit loosened. You know, we find them too strict Mm -hmm. and, you know, too, too, too reductive and and too limiting. And so we too wanted them to be sort of loosened up a bit, just like the postmodernists, just like the chaos magicians, just like the new thought people. And okay, that has happened, but it's not happening quite the way, quite the magical way that, you know, many of us would have liked to have happened. And so, but, you know, um, that's why in the book I, I sort of, I, I, I kind of half tongue in cheek refer to Trump as the singularity. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, the singularity is this, this event, event horizon where our normal ideas about reality stop and break down. So a black hole, time and space are very different. Uh, and then in this sort of new age millenarian idea that there's a singularity some, somewhere down the line in history and when we reach there, conditions on you know earth will be very different we'll be in a golden age again or something like that well i think trump's election has been a singularity in the sense that as i say all of our ideas about truth and reality and fact and fiction have folded in on each other and become all topsy-turvy and the world's very different since he's you know since they're not not in some necessarily metaphysical sense there's still time and space but how we understand yes and how, how we use language and it strikes me that we, we are baffled and confused by things now that not too long ago we would have had very kind of clear ideas about. But now we sort of, we don't, is, is that true? I don't know. We all sort of, we, we hesitate now to make sort of, you know, and it's a very divisive time too, you know. It's a very explosive, polarized sort of time. So, um, yeah. I felt when, when Trump was elected, the, the sense I was getting from my American friends the confusion and they, they they were baffled with this new reality and the reality itself seemed to me quite similar to the 90s in russia after the collapse of the soviet union yeah, I can understand that, yeah. and it's yeah. like the the previous reality seems to be fallen apart or in the in the case with russia completely fell apart and there's nothing to replace it exactly and so all of these new things are coming out you know from the cracks yeah yeah and this is, I'm really curious about your take on Dugin, because uh, mm-hmm. that, that's the environment that he kind of uh, established himself, I guess. Yes, yes. And I think his project is to offer something, to suggest something, to replace the previous reality that, yes, that disseminated. Yes, yes, yes. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. Now, with Dugin, do you see... Uh, you know, we were talking about uh, the chaos magic and Pepe the Frog and all of mm-hmm. that, and a big part of that is... It's supposed to be funny. It's like yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah. it can't be taken completely serious. There's a lot of, you know, it's the shit posters who are uh, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the name of the people who are doing that. Do you see uh, a similar kind of quality in Dugan's work? Because 
I've Mm-mm. seen him. I haven't researched him, but uh, he's been in the background. Kind of, I would see him on television every now and yeah, again. Yeah. And on the one hand, he is this, you know, very conservative man with a beard, looks like an Orthodox priest or something. He's an old believer, right? And he's, uh, you know, quite serious in his tone, but yeah. not uh, uh, not uncommon for him to say something. You know, I think I remember once on television he was, you know, presented as an expert on geopolitics and a philosopher uh-huh. and all that and uh he was being asked about like what's your uh how do we save russia how do what's the answer to uh-huh. Uh-huh. you know heal our country and his answer was something like well you know what we've lost peasants in old russia would get into a circle and hold hands and run around in circle and uh-huh. it's like a traditional uh kind of dance type thing for celebrations and we we're not doing that enough. If we just run in circles more, because and then there are connections because this uh, somehow relates to like solar symbolism and yes, yes, connection yes. to the archaic world and da da da. Yes. If we just ran around in circles, holding hands more, yeah, like yeah. you, I, it's difficult to imagine, you know, Russian people watching that, taking that very seriously. Mm, 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 you know, mm. yeah, yeah. Well, I I I I, I think. From what I understand, I mean, I've, I've just I've seen some things on um, the net, um, some interviews, and I've, I've I've read quite a bit, and I you know I and read about him, and I you know I get the feeling that he's he's a bit of a showman, mm-hmm. um, uh, again like Trump to a certain degree. He he knows how to use an audience, and I mean you know my understanding that you know his, his he started out uh, as this sort of punk you know dissident in the eighties. Right. And uh, playing guitar. And, he, and even then, he, uh, again, from what I understand, he sort of had a certain look. You know, he had, he had the guitar and he sort of dressed in a very kind of bohemian way and had a hair, you know, strange haircut and all this kind of thing. And so I, I, I get the feeling he always had, um, he always aware of how his appearance and the impression he makes and that, that kind of thing and all that. And then, you know, just following the different sort of political changes he's made, you know, he's put a national Bolshevism and then. Right. Eurasianism and a variety of other things. So, um, I think he, you know, I think he says outrageous things for effect. Uh, I think it's what I can gather from what I've read. I think he's sort of, uh, you know, I think he knows what he's doing. I think he knows what he's doing when he's making that effect. Um, and so uh, again, that that's kind of an element of kind of magic as well. You sort of you 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 go in wanting to have a certain kind of make a certain kind of impression on your audience. And I think he he does that sort of thing. But uh, mm-hmm. uh, um, you know, I think it is true that he's sort of reaching in back into these ancient old you know um, folkloric kind of traditions in order to root. You know, this Russia, as you say, has been kind of without an anchor. It's, right. you know, this is quite some time now. This is like almost 30 years, you know, now it's been in different sorts of ways. So I think he's trying to do that. But no, I, I, I think there is an element of where he's kind of saying things that, you know, but again, that's the whole sort of postmodern thing. Oh, are you really a Nazi? Oh, well, did you really think I was serious? And then if, if you ask that, then somehow you, you, you weren't hip enough to know that it was just right. a joke. Right. But that, that's, a, to me, that's a sort of like... Um, kind of you know uh a disclaimer uh it's a kind of you know personal um deniability you know you you you, you and you don't quite because he you know again he he makes these outrageous statements and then he often says something that's very different and and he, he kind of if you if you sort of you know pin him down to something he'll as i said he'll say oh no i was just joking it was just kind of a joke and can't you take it you know you're too serious kind of thing so that's kind of an all-purpose way to avoid you know taking responsibility for, you know, some of the things, especially I know, you know, some of his more outrageous statements about national socialism and, and mm-hmm, things of that sort. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, but he also, you know, during the, the, the Ukraine, um, you know, episode, um, he made that famous statement that cost him his job at the university where someone asked him, you know, what should we do? And he said, kill them, kill them, kill them. And this, he meant the Ukrainians. And this was right. something really like, you know, so, he probably, you know, he's a loose cannon. He probably, you know, uh, sometimes explodes and he doesn't quite, you know, um, maybe he's make something that's a bit injudicious. But I would say if he acts like a holy fool sometimes in the way of saying, you know, crazy and outrageous things, there's probably a tactic behind it. Mm-hmm. But that's just my that's just my guess from sort of, you know, reading. Um, because I think he knows, again, he was a conspiriologist. You know, he, he was a professional conspiracy theorist for, you know, uh, a, a newspaper uh in in russia so you know he's very much knows how 
to create something that, again, this whole idea that you create a reality, you know, yeah. it, it doesn't really matter if it has any kind of basis in fact anymore. It's whether you can get people to understand it and accept it. Two things came to mind while you were talking. One mm -hmm. is, it almost seems like this this element uh, of this all might be a joke might be one of the kind of prerequisites in the modern day to use these like magical ideas or, you know, like we can't just straightforwardly go into, we're doing magic now. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if there is a kind of chicken tongue uh, disposition to it, we're just mm -hmm. playing on the internet, then then you can experiment with it in a kind of a safe. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, I mean, you know, I, I, I also think, if it is, if we do live in a magical world, which, as I said, I accept the reality of synchronicities. So to some degree, I accept that we do. These things can happen by themselves, too. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you might be playing around with it. You might right, be thinking right, you're right. just doing this for fun. Right. But there's something else that might. Again, Keck, 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 Keck was saying, Keck, Keck was saying, yes, yes, do more of that. Yes, right, here's another right. trip. Here's another double. Here's another quadruple. <laughs> do more, do more. And it's sort of like, I'm growing, I'm getting bigger. You know, mm. I mean, that's again, again, I'm, I'm, is it really happening? I don't know, but it's a possibility. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in this kind of world. So I, I try to keep a level head about it at the same time. Mm -hmm. I try to keep an open mind because I mean, how do you explain when these things spread? I mean, how do you explain when kind of, I mean, Trump in a way, he kind of spread he was kind of like a sleepwalker in one sense. I mean, um, I mean, I, 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 when I first heard that he put his hat in the ring, as they say in America, when he, you know, decided to run, I thought he was going to win only because I thought, yes, it makes perfect sense that a reality TV star would become right. president of the United States these days. So it just seemed like that was going to happen. I didn't want him to, I didn't particularly want Hillary Clinton to be president either, but mm -hmm. I thought better, the better, the evil, you know, or the, the, the devil, you know, than. But, but other people thought differently. No, let's shake things up. Let, yeah, let's, I had, let's, I had let's, that let's, feeling. Let's set the apple cart. And I think that's what many people wanted. And people just wanted that to happen. You know, there's, yes, th th that's another thing too, which I didn't really talk about in the book, but there's this mystical idea about change. Hmm. And it gets, something, something happens at, you know, in society at a certain point where people just get tired of whatever is happening and they just want change, whatever it is. And mm -hmm. at that point, they're open to whatever might happen regardless of the consequences that things have become so stuffy and stagnant that they just want that. And I think that in many ways is what, you know, that was the wave that swept Trump in and, you know, the alt-right and all these other people were part of that too, because that's, that's why they got behind him. You know, they just wanted to, you know, sort of knock things over and, you know, clear the decks so that, you know, something new can happen. And again, that's the chaos. That's the right. chaos that, that the chaos that precedes the new dawn. And that's the other side of Keck. Keck was the god of chaos, but he also was sort of the god that presaged the, the new dawn, you know, the, the sun rising again. And so Trump may not be the main figure. He may be a kind of character who, you know, creates the conditions for something else to take place. We don't know. Again, that's – I'm not saying that. I'm saying this is a possibility. I um, saw, I saw. I think on your Twitter uh... – I don't know what you what you were referring to, but uh, you floated the idea of Trump being a tulpa, not even a real <laughs> <laughs> human. A, t a tulpa is a kind of thought form. Um, you know, we're talking about thoughts are things and thoughts are causative, mm -hmm. and so you, not only can you make things happen, you can kind of create actually create a reality in the mm -hmm. sense that you can project an image from your mind out into the the real world. And the famous story uh, was told by uh, this French explorer. This a fantastic woman named Alexandra David Neal uh, in the early 20th century. She was one of the first, if not the first, sort of European woman to get into Lhasa in, in Tibet. Um, Matt Levatsky said she'd been to Tibet, but it's we don't know for sure. But Alexandra David Neal did go there. And she, she studied with these monks for a long time. And part of this Tibetan magic is this idea of creating thought forms. And she writes about this in this fantastic book called Magic and Mystery in Tibet. And she tells how the monk taught her how to create a, a thought form. And what she did was she created a monk. She mm -hmm. sort of imagined him, visualized him very, you know, vividly and, and, and you know, uh, intensely in her mind. And then gradually could see him, him outside, you know, in, in the real world. And then gradually, she said, he took on a life of his own and sort of got out of her control. And uh, the, the other monks in the monastery said, well, you have to do something about this. You have to do something about this because your monk is going around. He's like, he's getting into lots of trouble. He's doing lots of things. 
And so she had to somehow sort of reabsorb him. And this idea with the tulpa, it, it, it takes on a life of its own and you have to kind of, you know, get it back in. And I, I sort of, again, I, again, tongue in cheek, I sort of say, well, can, can we consider Trump a tulpa? Mm-hmm. Is, is he kind of this thought form that's been created? It, 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 in a way, he was almost 50 percent there because, again, he already was inhabiting right, the electronic right. world of the, you know, the alternate, alternate reality, which is becoming more and more real. And the 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 once real reality is becoming more and more strange and so he kind he we, we sort of his his believers his devotees his his you know uh his trumpians they they somehow pulled him out of of the you know the the electronic world and there he is but now you know has he got out of control um is he not <laughs> <laughs> is he not has he gone on his own and yeah who's going i don't, to sort, I don't know if he <laughs> ever was under control of anybody <laughs> well, i know i'm just saying it's it's you know it's it's a joke it's a half right, but at the right. same time it's like well you know can, can we can we can we is this a metaphor we can kind of use to sort of understand um what's going on so um yeah we'll see i i, I don't know i mean um um I, I i did tweet him and said mentioned the book to him but i haven't heard <laughs> i haven't heard back so i don't know it'd be interesting to hear his take yeah um you mentioned um uh, you know chaos as a uh thing that precedes a new mm. so, some new form and uh, i think um uh, i've heard you talk about your new project you're going to be working or are working now on a book about russian what is it search for a russian identity well it's it's sort of the the idea of the rise or the return of holy russia so that's why I, I, I got it right then. So it seemed it seemed to me that Putin's is seemed is sort of going in that direction. Um, yeah, I would agree and, with and, that. And you say, as you say, Duke Dukin has been there already, you know, for a while. So right. And so so then, uh, if we if I try to continue my comparison between you know post Trump America and Russia mm-hmm. of the 1990s, the chaos of 1990s went to is now leading to this new idea of holy russia a new vision mm-hmm. of uh, of russia that putin and perhaps dugan other people are trying to put together yeah are you following um these people who are uh supposedly who supposedly put trump in in place is do you think there is something that's supposed mm-hmm. to come after the chaos of trump i don't know i i to tell you the truth i haven't sort of kept up with mm-hmm. stuff there so much is like because i did that book and then um because i felt there was so much stuff happening in russia and because i i just the whole as you say the whole story of russia you know with the collapse of the soviet union and everything you've gone through uh it just it just struck me as so fascinating and so um and and uh in, in a way it just uh I, i wanted to understand more and it just seemed to me this this was I don't know. I mean, I don't really, in a way, I'm not that interested in what's happening in the States. That, that sounds that sounds strange, but um, there, there's, there is something. I've always been very interested in Russian philosophy, Dostoevsky and Berdyaev and people like that, and, and the Silver Age, you know. Uh, and what's fascinating now, what I discovered and what made me want to do this is that Putin seems to be referring in his speeches, more recent speeches, to people from the Silver Age, people right. like Berdyaev and Solovyev, mm-hmm. and, uh, mm-hmm. uh, Ivan Illin and people like that. And these are, you know, These are important. I mean, it's not the power of positive thinking. You know, I mean, the power. Of, I mean, like the Trump, <laughs> Trump power of positive thinking. It's a nice book. It's very, you know, um, motivating. But it's not. It's not demanding philosophy. And uh, I, I don't know how much Putin himself, you know, can read of Solovyev. But the fact that he supposedly asked his regional governors to read these works struck me as, oh, that's very interesting. And and again, reading. A, Uh, articles in Business Week and The Economist and other ones, foreign affairs. Uh, it seems like the the Western diplomats are they're not really caught up to what he's doing. Mm-hmm, they don't mm-hmm. really quite get the idea that he he's taking this traditional values sort of thing and the Holy Russia thing seriously. Uh, this is the whole idea where there isn't there isn't an ideological you know battle anymore. And there, well, actually there is. There's the the decadent West and this you know the traditional society that um, Putin seems to want to, you know, uh, make Russia. And again, that's part of this whole history of Russia, the whole idea that it's the third Rome. It, it's taken on the mantle of the true, the true Christian, you know, mission after the fall of Rome and Constantinople. And all that's fascinating to me again, because it's this, it has this apocalyptic sense to it, this messianic sense. And again, it's a sense of history kind of 
coming to a head. And it does seem to be things are changing. You know, the, yeah. it, it isn't the century of the United States anymore. Uh, NATO is getting very sh shaken up. Um, I don't know. I, I'm, 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 I'm in no way a politician or, or geopolitical thinker, but it does seem that Putin is sort of stretching things out a bit and, you know, seeing what happens and all that. So just as someone who has been more interested in history to suddenly feel like it's kind of, ooh, it's caught up and now I can mm -hmm, say mm -hmm. this is happening now. So, and uh, I've just been fascinating for me to go, to go back and read people, but also to read um, a great deal that I, I hadn't read about Russian history. And, um, and, and not to sound, uh, 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 what, what, you know, uh, patronizing, but it, strike, it strikes me that Russia has history in the way that England um, doesn't have a climate. England has weather, you know, in the sense that there isn't a climate in England. There's weather. You get everything, and it's mostly rain and all that. But in Russia, you seems to have it has it doesn't have a history as it has so much all of the elements that make up history in the sense of wars and catastrophes <laughs> and, and and revolutions and and uh, uh, just invasions and all this sort of thing and it's just this incredible kind of um you know uh, vast landscape um and um no i mean in a way i wish i could go on actually just doing the research but i have to start writing the book and um actually as 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 we speak i'm going through my notes now i'm just mm. been looking over you know all this kind of stuff but yeah that's the idea sort of like um this uh, uh, <clears throat> That's that's the general idea. I, I don't have a, 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 a actual title just yet, but it's sort of this return of Holy Russia, um, and and also things like the the influence of, of Freemasonry in the 18th uh, century uh, uh, Russia was you know uh, around the time of Catherine the Great before she sort of um, sort of banned it and all that. It was incredibly uh, very influential, and it's out of that sort of tradition that people like Madame Blavatsky come because her great great grandfather was part of that kind of Russian Rosicrucian Freemasonry in the late 18th century. And again, it had political plans, this whole notion of sort of redrawing the map of Europe. And so it, it's, it's a very, very interesting kind of, um, how should we say it, introduction to this old, whole other way of looking at you know, mm -hmm. history, say, for the last thousand years. Have you ever looked at uh, the Russian cosmists? Oh, yeah, I've just been, I've just been reading um, about them. Uh, 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 Fedorov is going to be you know, in there, um, and uh, Sulikovsky, and um, yeah, there's a wonderful book by George Young. George Young, I, inter I did a couple of interviews on this site. Oh yeah, no, no, fantastic stuff, yeah, yeah, and um, no, that, that's, uh, I mean, and I remember that this other, this British writer, John Gray, he did a book a few years ago called The Immortalization Commission, mm -hmm. and he has a whole section on the God Builders, mm -hmm. uh, and, and the Cosmists come in there as well. Uh, no, I mean, I, it's, 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 it's incredible, I mean, um, Another thing I have in mind is a kind of book about transhumanism, but that's that's a couple. That, that's that that's I, I, that's just an inkling of an idea, but it would bring in a lot of the cosmos kind of stuff and all that sort of thing. Well, I'll, so. I'll definitely be looking forward to this. Um, so the reason I brought up cosmos is I thought um, that's another like attempt at creating like a coherent vision, a place for Russians in the world, but also uh, a way of looking at reality. Mm. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, that also like the the school of thought, the thinkers themselves, uh, you know, started with the 19th century. But the term, the umbrella term, cosmos, was invented mm. something like late uh, 80s. Mm. So it's mm. also okay. a time of, I think it's like the beginning of the search for a new vision yeah, yeah, because yeah. the previous one was kind of dying out at that time. Well, I mean, it's again. I have to say, I mean, I, I, I grew up. Um, I was a baby boomer, and for you know, up until well, I guess until the early, the late eighteen, late eighties, you know, the Russia, the Soviet Union was there. It was this you know powerful entity, and then the whole idea that it just almost overnight, you know, yeah. wasn't there. That it, it happens, you know, uh, things that seem absolutely stable and and without doubt, you know, are going to exist can just change. And that's, uh, you know, who knows? So who knows? You know, this may be, this may be the century of the new Russia, of, of Eurasia. Who knows? Maybe Dugan's right. Who knows? We'll see what happens. Um, another thing that, that uh, I thought of, uh, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes ago when you were talking about Dugan, um, mm. I saw an interview with him where, so he uses postmodernism, like the, the way he relates to the term, is, uh, you know, he thinks it's a bad, bad thing and we don't want to get there. Uh, luckily, Russia, he thinks, 
uh, I don't think he even considers Russia a modern, like in, in mm, a stage mm, of mm, modernism. Mm, 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 yeah. So, so he's like, we, we need to figure out, you know, if we go the route that the West went, then we're going to end up in this postmodernism reality and we don't want to get there. Yeah. But then he says, the, the part that I found curious is he says we can use, now that postmodernism, most, postmodernism exists, we can use it as a weapon against yeah. itself. Yeah, so we sure. We can use it as a tool. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, he well, he he himself. I mean, again, he well, he's a contradiction, which is, I guess, uh, many ways, you know, this essential to postmodernism and and also chaos magic, where you have things that could be, you know, radically different or somehow put together in some strange way, because all, there's no there's no rules anymore. So, I mean, he he brings together traditionalism mm -hmm. and postmodernism, um, uh, and he's postmodern to me in the way he kind of plays with different ideologies and puts them together like like lego blocks right you know he sort of takes bit you know, here's some national socialism here's some bolshevism here's some of stalin and let's put that in there and see what happens with that uh so that strikes me as postmodern but yes this kind of you know traditionalist metaphysic that he has um isn't but he mixes things up that's the whole thing it, it's this it's this that's one of the things you can't pin him down just like trump i mean again you can't pin him down anywhere it doesn't matter if if he contradicts himself because he'll it, it, that it doesn't matter you're, you're applying old rules you're applying rules mm -hmm. that used to work in the old world where you had to be true and you didn't want to make you know, wanted to make sure you weren't lying but to this new world where well, hey it doesn't matter you know it's it's you, you we're creating our reality as as it goes so no i mean I, I think this is um in one sense you know you it's either this creative blend of all this kind of stuff or this kind of you know incomprehensible incoherent mess which i think dugan often <laughs> As far as I, from what I've read, he slides in and out of one or the other. Sometimes it's, you know, it's, it's brilliant, and, I, and other times it just becomes, you know, I don't quite get this. That, that it's just, it's just this kind of lather of, of mm -hmm. kind of rhetoric, and mostly against, you know, as you say, directed against the West. You know, the right, right, directed right. against the, the the twittering, buzzing, rhizomatic, you know, Western individual who's this kind of insect, kind of. It, it's, and, you know, it's just this kind. Of, Sometimes I just find myself <laughs> laughing. It's just kind of insect-looking little creatures in the West are going around, and zzz, zzz, and he wants to eradicate them. You know, he wants to just come and get rid of them all and all that. And so, I mean, I, I can. Under, I mean, one of the things too is like you know, one of the things he leaves out is that many people in the West have have made the same criticisms. You know, the West has produced yeah. its own critics. You know, it just hasn't produced such a vehement kind of denunciation. And also, you know, he, he basically is saying we have to, we can't wait. We can't wait around for the end of the world expecting it to happen by itself. We have to kind of get behind it and get in there and make it happen. And, and oh, then yeah. once, it's, once it's over, we'll settle into this new organic, you know, theocratic traditional society, which is like a caste system where everyone's in their place. And, but he, he, the way he talks about it, it sounds like people won't even have individual minds anymore, but we'll be so integrated into the society and into, you know, the natural world. We'll, we'll, we'll sort of experience what he calls Dasein, which again, he throws in some Heidegger in there. And that, you know, the whole idea of an individual consciousness would just sort of no longer, you know, exist. And, and maybe for many people that, that, that might be, you know, something they look forward to. But I mean, I, I'm, I'm certainly aware of all the problems in the West, but when I see what he offers as an alternative, it, it strikes me as, you know, worse than the disease. Right. Yeah. Um, we're almost at an hour. I had one random question that doesn't right. connect to this directly, though actually there is a connection, I think, with, with okay. the Kyakistan and with postmodernism and whatnot. I know that you've mm. written some article um, about Jordan Peterson. Yes, I did, yeah. Yep. Uh, but I couldn't find it online. I think it's only in it, it's, it's, it's not online. It's, um, it's in print with a, a magazine called uh, New Dawn that comes out of Australia. In fact, I've been... I, I mean to ask them to see if they can put it up online because occasionally they do. Because I actually think, you know, it's a good article. So it's, uh, more people should read it. Yeah. I'm curious about your take on him. Actually, now yeah. that I think about it, 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 in my mind, that connects to what we're talking about pretty directly. Because mm -mm -mm. it seems to me that, well, one, he's on this crusade against postmodernism as he yeah. perceives it. And two, he might be one of the attempts to suggest a new vision after the previous one collapsed don't you think mm, 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 mm. well yeah i mean he he, he interests me in fact um it was a while ago that um a facebook correspondent 
suggested I check out uh, these videos he had up on YouTube. And this is this is a couple of years ago by now, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is before he was very well known. And uh, and this Facebook friend said, you know, it seemed to me that you and Peterson had some ideas in common. Uh, so I thought I'd check it out. And um, I found, you know, I, I like these early videos. And, and I, 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 you know, I, he was feisty. He was, you know, sort of combative. And he mm -hmm. was engaging. And he was a very good kind of speaker. And also he was talking about Jung and Dostoevsky. And, uh, but really, but, but what really uh, did it for me was precisely, as you say, his, his critique of postmodernism. And what struck me was that many years ago when I was uh, a student, uh, a, a mature student. I, I went back to university in the in the eighties um, and nineties, and um, at the time there was a famous book called *The Closing of the American Mind* by uh, an American academic named Alan Bloom. Uh, and what he was critiquing was the prevalence of left wing sort of ideology in the universities, mm -hmm. and how all of these student radicals from the sixties had got tenure. Right in universities, and they and they were teaching, you know, basically Frankfurt School and and you know Marcuse and, and stuff like that, and uh, and he felt it was undermining sort of Western education and so on. And he he wasn't a conservative himself, like um, like Peterson. He considered himself a classic liberal. Mm -hmm. uh, he was he was gay um, and, and 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 Jewish, and he belonged to you know he belonged to more than one kind of oppressed um, kind of minority. But he was arguing against the kind of um, Leftist, the, sa the saturation of leftist ideology, and 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 especially in humanities, and and then when I I, I did a stint in graduate school, I remember I, I was doing um, English lit at a prestigious university in California, and I went back as a mature student, and uh, it was completely taken over by all the things that Bloom, you know, was worried about a few years earlier, and I dropped out because I knew I was never going to get a job. I was white, I was mm -hmm. male. I had no interest in deconstructing anything. You know, all, uh -huh. all I wanted to do was like really understand literature, and you know, I was more of an old romantic humanist, and there was no place for me. So when I saw Peterson, you know, talking about this stuff, I said, "Yeah, that's right, go for it." Because he was like, it seemed to me that he was he was encountering the full-grown beast that I had encountered, uh -huh. you know, when as it was just cub. you know, quite, quite as a cub, yeah. And then I just, you know, I, his whole idea about responsibility and 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 so on and all that, I, I just thought was you know very. Um, accurate and and true and uh, and uh, I, I read his book, you know, the Twelve Rules, and it's it's a self help book. It's not it's not great literature. I mean, most people who have anything going for them already know more or less, you know, what he's right. talking about. But but I can understand how its popularity. It sort of struck me as kind of like the Robert Bly of of this millennial kind. Of, if you remember, this Robert Bly, his book Iron John. Uh, from you're probably too young um, in the in the in the in the early 90s. It was kind of like the book that was responsible for for the men's movement. And uh -huh. again, it was similarly, you know, men need to sort of you know embrace their own kind of character. They they shouldn't feel guilty, you know, and and feel somehow, uh, you know, that they're guilt, you know, the guilty for all the evils in the world and so on and so on. And I I just like you know I just like you know how he was and especially. I appreciated about his attack on postmodernism was precisely his attack on this nihilism that mm -hmm. um, I, I, I feel has, has saturated everything. Um, and so, yes, I, 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 I was, I was you know, very much for him in, in, in that article. I haven't kept up. You know, I did the article some months ago, so I, I don't really touch on all of his remarks about gender pay gap and you know, women having children and all that kind of stuff. And I know there's much more controversial stuff all around that. Uh, but for that, 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 one area where I felt that he was confronting, you know, in, in, in a very vigorous and necessary way, this kind of, you know, postmodern hegemony is one of the words they use themselves. So it itself had kind of become this kind of monster that, mm -hmm. you know, was trying to stop it from. So, yeah, I mean, I've actually, I mean, I've tried to, you know, get in touch with him in different ways, but, you know, he became a, you know, superstar. So, you know, everyone's going to try and get in touch with him. But um, yeah. Um, no, I, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's a good article. In fact, I'll I'll you reminded me. I'll I'll uh, I'll ask uh, New Dawn if they'll put it up on online. I I want to read that. Yeah, I'm I, I'm really curious. Like watching Peterson just as a phenomenon is is very curious for me. Not mm. even the substance of what he says, though. Oh, that yeah, yeah, also yeah. has its appeal. But yeah. the fact that he now performs at you know in front of three four thousand people in every city and they. I guess, like to me, I I watched these. I watched like mm. the, the you know when he 
goes out on the stage and the crowd oh, yeah, yeah. cheers that yeah, to yeah. me is like th these are americans aren't they they're, they're really like... <laughs> well again again it's uh he's become i i said i remember he it was amazing how he became a overnight celebrity i mean one of the things that did it was when he came here to london and he had this interview with um this tv journalist named kathy newman mm -hmm. uh who's very kind of right on and you know pro-feminist and all that and she kind of came out wanting to kind of you know take him down and he was very cool and calm collected right. stuck to the point and she she just basically lost it and it, it was the complete opposite he turned it around completely in his favor and and uh after that it was just like you know he was in all the newspapers he was everywhere and so um you know i think the time is right you know um I know he's had some association with the alt right. My impression is that he's tried to clarify that and and you know a variety of different things. And I think he is trying to walk this increasingly narrow yeah. space that's not one side or the other, which to me it just strikes me as kind of common sense and intelligence. I, I would say, and uh, not not getting caught up in the rhetoric either the left or, or the right. Um, and uh, but I can't, you know, good for him. He's a you know psychotherapist and a psychologist because he probably need his training in order to deal with the celebrity uh, that he's got. <laughs> yeah. so it, it, it can be quite dangerous. These things can go to your head and you know you wouldn't want him to turn into a kind of demagogue and I suspect that many people already think that that's you know what he's sort of doing mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, more power to him you know. Yeah I mean it, it, it seems that maybe the path that he's doing with like he talks about Jung and he talks about archetypes and the archetypal yeah. stories and brings in into you know he's talking about part responsibility and uses Pinocchio and the gospel as an example of this and yeah, that yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking maybe that's like at the beginning of the conversation I said that uh, the tongue-in-cheek approach to magic or mm. you know some of these like ideas mm. that are not strictly materialistic or you know scientific or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's one approach. Maybe his approach is the second uh, that is being tried out now, with a, focusing on the stories, focusing mm -hmm. on the. Yeah. Well, he's he's tapping into the mythic. Right. I mean, he's, I mean, I, his his first book, Maps of Meaning, which which I read, and he's he's basically trying to devise a new way in which to understand old myths. Mm -hmm. And again, that that puts him in this you know Jungian. Uh, Joseph Campbell, kind of, not quite. Right. You know, Joseph Campbell was a mythographer, whereas um, Peterson is a behavioral psychologist, and you know, he, he's also you know very good about relationships and things of that sort. But again, it's this kind of thing where uh, there, there is any, there, there, there is a human nature. You know, we're not we're not blank slates. We're not tabula rasa, and on which whatever we want can be written, which I guess is the basis of the so the, the idea that. We are socially constructed. So your mm -hmm. identity, who you are, mm -hmm. is something that is constructed by society. And I guess what Peterson's saying and what Jung, Campbell, and Robert Bly, and also you know the great American psychologist, Abraham Maslow, um, who's sort of the father of humanist psychology, he would, he would agree with Peterson too. And he, he said there was sort of inbuilt biological kind of needs as a hierarchy of needs and you know and 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 one of them is the need to sort of to grow to develop and all these kind of things so it, it's the sense that um we're not just kind of well-meaning social planners who want to create the great society can't just get a hold of human nature and do what they want with it this is this is the this is the hyper left optimistic vision which mm -hmm. in one sense you want to say yes why not you know this society is such a mess why don't we just go and do it well if you try to do that you lose out on the other side and the other side is this idea that there's a kind of human nature it's limited it has certain kind of you know uh, um, obstacles within itself and that, that's the need for religion religion shows you a way to confront suffering and confront you know life's uh, inequities and injustices and so and 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 your own you're like uh, peterson talks about your own shadow your own evil your own darkness and all that kind of thing and um you know the one side is saying you know no no if you just think humans are a blank slate you 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 sort of you, you do an injustice to human nature the other side says yes but if you want to say that all this stuff is just natural and it's there we can't do anything about it and we want to make a better world so you know they're sort of been doing that for a long time um Obviously, it's some combination of both, but we, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's easier said than done. But that's that, that's what I like about him is that yes, it recognizes that there is some kind of um, something that's given. Mm -hmm. You know, we're mm -hmm. no, we're not born empty slates. And um, I, I I would say our natures aren't completely fixed. I would say we have a 
uh, evolutionary kind of character, which we, we do grow, we do want to get have new experiences, we want to assimilate. And that's what he talks about too, you know, the unknown. You right, know, there's the, the known, which is safe, and then there's the unknown, which is chaos, and the hero is the one who goes out into the unknown and sort of assimilates it and expands the area of the known. And yeah, of course, you know. So um, in that sense, I, I you know, I, I, I appreciate what he's what, what he's trying to do. Um, unfortunately, it's in this context of everything being hyper politicized, and it just turns into you know this kind of you know uh, factions and and, yeah. and, and polarizations, yeah. which. Um, I mean, in the book, I talk about this notion of the war of all against all, um, which the philosopher Hobbes said was the state of primitive, you know, natural man mm -hmm. before civilization. But we seem to have reached a kind of similar uh, state in this Internet world in which we're all kind of competing for um, likes you know, on social media, we're all sort of competing with everybody else to get right. more likes. And then each individual group is competing against the other for its own rights and its own freedom and its own identity and the whole notion of identity politics and all that. So, you know, everything's fracturing into these individual little atoms who are fighting against each other. And, um, yeah, I, th I think that's one of the, you know, uh, characteristics in which we live today and, and we have to sort of find a way to get through it. Yeah. Well, okay, we went over an hour. Well, uh, we'll, we'll end on that. That, that happened. Yeah, we'll, yeah. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see where that where that leads us. Back to uh, me next year. See what happens. I'm I'm really looking forward to your new book and your your uh, upcoming work. And if yeah, you if you are I'll, willing I'll, to I'll, do, I'll keep you in touch, and I'll 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 let you know as soon as it's available, and we'll arrange for an interview and all that. I'll send you a copy. Perfectly. That sounds great. Thank yeah. you so much. My pleasure. All right. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye.